This is Mark. Hi, Mark. This is Liz Maria. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, now is a good time to talk. <laughs> sure. Why not? Yeah, I know. We already already conferred with you. Um, uh, let me give. You, I mean, I said a little bit about my background in the email, but just to sort of clarify. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm an American journalist. Yeah. I live in Milan. Um, I am the editor of a magazine um, that is produced by a company called H Farm, and we cover culture, innovation, technology, um, philosophy. And so this article, well, so our our next issue is loosely based around evolution uh -huh. and sort of like the evolution of, you know, it's very broad. So, uh, you know, evolution, science, sure. Uh, sure. but also the evolution of thought and um, design and all of that. So I'm chatting with you because of your um, flat earth work. Yeah. And I watched a, a few of your videos on YouTube and I also watched the documentary um behind the curve what was yeah behind the curve i just watched it this morning <laughs> like, oh wow <laughs> just this morning <laughs> all right well that's fresh yeah. in your head then well i mean you know um here in milan i don't know if you're on lockdown over there where you are um but we are going into week three of our lockdown so i have you know more time available than <laughs> i usually well, i was like well i might as well watch it why not <laughs> sure why not um yeah we're not you know our lockdown you know since we were, we're broken into states um we're it's it's really a case-by-case -case basis a state-by-state -state thing where the governors are kind of not everybody's on the same page uh you know the, the policies are are wide and varied so but yeah. it's yeah it's getting pretty pretty dicey over here you know there's some states that are thinking about breaking ranks and just saying hey mm. you know what screw it we'll take the risk we're going to go back to work and the government's saying no and you've got the president saying oh yeah we can we can whip you know we could get back to normal by easter and mm. you know other people are saying no so yeah it's it's weird well, how how's week three treating you guys you know we're hearing reports that that it's really, really bad, but, uh, you know, I've talked to other people there in Italy that, that say it, it doesn't seem that bad. W what's your take? Um, well, I'm in Milan, which is like the center of the red zone. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what, I don't even know what it's called anymore. Let's just call it the red zone. Okay. The red zone. Yeah. So, I mean, and I live alone, so that has its own fun uh benefits sort of prison like you know benefits but then also not not so great sometimes but i mean everything's closed so including so, so is this grocery store is open oh, okay and pharmacies are open and sort of like walgreens type places are open but only in the afternoon for like a couple of hours huh yeah that's that's and pretty pretty similar to what we have here the grocery stores are open the pharmacies are open um but then it's really varied for us because you know that whole essential you know what is essential businesses you know is your hardware yeah. store essential is your clothing store essential what about hair salons yeah so i don't yeah so you know i can three weeks I can, you know, so you guys are kind of ahead of us in, in time frames. Yeah. What, so it's three weeks, yeah. you're, you're starting to climb the walls already? Uh, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult. We're not really like exercise. It's not like it's banned, but it's supposed to be limited. So I've been like getting up pretty early and I'm not a morning person at all. Gotcha. I get up, you know, now, 6.30 is it... more running when the police. Or, you know, is it not, is it true no, that yeah. <laughs> that some police question you if you're out walking around? Yeah, yeah, that yeah. happened to me. Actually. Really? I mean, do you have to do you have to show them anything, or do you just tell them it's like, hey, I'm getting food, get out of me, you know, get out of my face. Um, I mean, 
I wasn't asked to show anything, but like technically they could ask for uh, like, you know, this, there's this like paper you're supposed to fill out that says why you're leaving your home, but I haven't. Wow. I haven't filled and so, like, so basically in Milan, not to drag this out, but it's so in Milan, the streets are basically empty. Yeah, yeah. completely. Wow. Yeah. And, and, to, and well, let me, let, let me ask you one more thing before we get into whatever you want to talk about, uh, is, um, because people over here are very, very curious because, you know, journalists, American journalists can't go anywhere. So we just yeah. have to take whatever, whatever's coming out of your guys' side, whether we create it or not. So, you know, there's a lot of skeptical people. It's like, okay, why is Italy supposedly dying? Whereas, or, yeah. or Spain and, and we're not, um, do they, do they, so you're into it three weeks. Did they give you any idea of how much longer they're going to be continuing this? Um, not really. Like. This lockdown was supposed to end April 3rd, but I really don't think that it's happening. Got I feel it. like it's going to be longer. I don't know how much longer, um, mm. but like the actual lockdown has been three weeks, but um, like the mm, gyms and like hair salons and basically any of the services where people are in really close contact, those yeah. closed, like, I don't know, five weeks ago or something. Wow. Here, here's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is, that is just wild. Um, th there's something I, I just read it before you called. Uh, it's gotten bad enough over here, you know, at least the fear, even though again, the death toll over here is ridiculously low for, for a country our size. Um, yeah. that people won't even take domestic flights if the only seats that are left are middle seats. So they are pulling oh. the middle seats out of the planes. Oh. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, That's funny. I didn't even, well, you know, cause it makes feel, pe people feel better about social distancing <laughs> and like they're killing oh off God. beverage service and, and other things like that to save money and, and stuff like that. But they're pulling the middle seats. And, you know, cause that's, uh, that's fairly easy to do, but it's like, wow, <laughs> that's never been done in yeah, the hi history of airplanes. I haven't heard that. Yeah. It's brand new. I mean, I, I thought about, cause I'm from California. I thought about like going back just cause I'm, you know, I'm working from home like indefinitely. So I was like, well, I might as well just do that from California, but then. I what? thought about the logistics and like the whole quarantine situation. Yeah, decided. yeah. Well, because yeah, where you're coming from, well, one, um, on, I imagine your passport's up to date. But if you have any visa trouble, like our visa department's shut down uh, entirely. So if there yeah. was any sort of issue, you'd have to literally have the embassy call the State Department if there was an issue. And yeah. Then, and then yeah, once yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Once you landed in California, if it was a nonstop flight, um, once they found out you were from Italy, you'd be put somewhere for a couple weeks, at least. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. I probably probably a safer bet as long as you can do it. Yeah. Um, la last last question, um, which is um, how you know because the grocery stores here are a nightmare, as you can imagine. You know, there's, um, I went to a, a supermarket yesterday and there's literally no paper products, no paper towels, no Kleenex, no toilet paper. Um, and mm -hmm. all hand, all hand sanitizer is now being rerouted to hospitals. So there's no more any, if, if there isn't any hand sanitizer in the stores right now, there's not going to be any for the foreseeable future. What's, what's it like? And no beef. For, that's another thing. I have no idea why everyone's <laughs> buying beef. Um, what's it like, like over the there? Toilet paper isn't such an issue on um, the hand sanitizer yes i haven't seen that in months um yeah. i mean like this sounds kind of silly but like pasta <laughs> i don't really no no pasta. that doesn't sound anything. silly no pasta, pasta is... is like seems to be you know the varieties there aren't so many varieties um what else oh eggs i don't know why my grocery store like never has eggs the only way i can get eggs is if i go there right when they open and then there's still some eggs yep you know that wow. and that that's the same thing <laughs> here you can get by the way you can get paper products here if you go to your grocery store the second they open 
but yeah. after 15 minutes, that's right. it. It is, it is over. Exactly. And, um, yeah. and don't even think, I mean, I'm sure you've watched the videos or seen it. Don't even think about going to Costco because Costco is, is oh, yeah, I'm sure. basically turned into a battleground where you line up for an hour, even before you get in the door. And then you're in there for probably two hours just to get out. <laughs> it's like, you, yeah. you basically, it's an all day event. And what are you, what are you going for? And people are sprinting once they get in there to, to straight to the paper products. It's like, I just, it's, it's staggering. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's, it's a wild, <laughs> it's a wild so, ride. This is the world we're living in at the moment. Yeah. And, who would have thought um, that that's, so this, let's, yeah. So, so let's, let's get into talk it. About, um, you're well okay so let's see i read so i saw that you have the flatters clues book and the video yep. but first i if if you could just tell me how you got involved with the flatters oh, yeah. movement because i saw that you used to be was it a professional video game yeah I was one of the and then a software yeah. developer yeah 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 well okay. soft software so, producer so more tell than me it how how this happened. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, yeah. So I started my career, um, I was a ringer. I, I was one of the early guys that played video games for a living. Not not nowadays where they're professional teams and they're playing for big yeah. money and arenas and all that. I mean, I just literally made games look better than they were. And because uh -huh. uh, you, you always want a ringer if you're showing off your games. And uh -huh. then I transitioned into proprietary software. So I was training people on... Um, on time and attendance software mostly which is really boring and dry it's a timekeeping software so when you like swipe mm -hmm. in at a factory you know it's all it's all it's been okay. digital for years and years and so i would travel around the country and some other countries training people on that and mm -hmm. then that was i was in colorado and i was doing that and while i was doing it because I, I never got i was never married and never had kids uh, mm -hmm. I had a lot of free time on my hands, so I delved into, you know, all the things that are the internet and you, you know, if you're mm -hmm. halfway decent at the internet at all, you're going to run into conspiracies. And, yeah. and once YouTube fired up, it really changed the tone of conspiracies because it was like, you know, the biggest television network in the world, but they didn't even know it. And mm -hmm. I looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of and had an opinion on every conspiracy you could think of. I'd, and but mm -hmm. the the one I, I you saw that in the documentary, but the one I would not look at, nobody should look at, is is flat Earth because it's dumb, it's stupid. And, <laughs> and but I was older, and so I thought, you know, I was in my forties, and it's like, yeah, you know what, I'll take a look. What 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 harm could it do? And it turned into this big snowball where I'm I'm sitting there just you know, staring at the globe, turning it over in my hand again and again, and going, okay, how would I prove the globe in a court of law? And it just, it just, I could never come up with a satisfactory case for the globe mm -hmm. to where finally, um, the beginning of 2015, I just gave up and I said, okay, I will make a series of videos. I will put them out on the internet because the internet hive mind is very, very intelligent. They don't miss anything. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, how do I prove the, the globe? Cause I don't think it's a globe anymore. I, I think we're in a building. I think we're, if you want to say it's a simulation, it's one thing, but, or God's footstool or whatever you want to call it, we're in a box. <laughs> we're, we're in a big simulate. We're, we're in the freaking matrix might as well, or, or a big sound stage, the Truman show. And uh -huh. that's when all, all of a sudden everybody just started coming to me. You know, I would have thought some, somebody from academia would have shut me down immediately. And that's what I was holding my breath for. But the opposite happened to where I had not, I mean, the, the general public is going, oh, this is really interesting. And the media, it's like, wow, this is new. And I'm going, it's not that new. But it was the subject matter experts that really threw me. It was the people from all branches of the armed forces and air traffic controllers and pilots and engineers. They all kept coming to me going, okay, I want to be a non, some were anonymous, some weren't. They said, yeah, you know what? I got something to tell you about this. You're not crazy. And here's why. And mm -hmm. nobody refuted their testimony and nobody even came out against them. And to where by the end of 2015, I was completely in, absolutely, totally in. It's like, all right, I, you know, apparently I have unearthed something by accident that, that should not be happening. And it just kept getting weirder and weirder and bigger and bigger people got into it uh, to where now, you know, we have conferences in multiple countries. I mean, I did, I did 
what seven or eight conferences in in as many countries last year you know we mm -hmm. we, we did one in auckland and canada and los angeles and stockholm and uk and um, I did street activism for Flat Earth in, in Belfast and Dublin, because that's mm -hmm. what you do. And it was it was crazy. So, yeah, that's, that's where I am now. I mean, I did I even did a, um, a commercial in, in Australia last year. A mobile mm -hmm. phone app thing called me and said, hey, how would you like to endorse our products? Like, OK, <laughs> sure. <laughs> let's do let's do that. I mean, I, I'm one of the oldest guys in it in terms of, of how many years. And, and I've only been doing it five years. So, uh, 20, cause 2015 was when you produced your videos, right? Yes. Yes. The first, like the clues. The yeah. 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 And by the way, I can give you, cause my machine, this, this, this tower auto records everything. So I can, I can, uh -huh. I can, if you're taking notes, I can dump you the audio after this, if you want. Oh, so. that would be cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. I'll, I'll just, I'll just That's email. So great. I'll just send it to you through, okay. through WeTransfer. Okay. Yeah, sorry for the typing. It it helps. No, 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 no. Go go ahead. Know. But but every time I hear somebody typing or writing notes, it's like, yeah. I mean, this I'm, this is why I record stuff. It's like, look, it'll yeah, save you. Yeah, that's good. Just for the um, you know, if there's something that I didn't quite hear, then it, I can go back. Exactly. Plus, you got time on your hands to listen to it. Apparently. <laughs> so. Yeah. But so you were saying that um, you know, people from the armed forces, air traffic control. Yeah. Um, are kind of, you know, come to you and said, oh, yeah, like, because I was reading or watching you talk about the um, Southern Hemisphere yeah. flight issue. Yeah. So, like, who, can you say who? Oh, yeah. In fact, they, it's not a secret. They they came to me and, and I asked them, hey, do you want to come on my podcast and and talk about There's I have a playlist uh -huh. on, my, on my channel called the um, Sub Subject Matter Experts Testimony Shows. And you can, uh -huh. they're all there, all recorded. And, okay. uh, and so there's... Can you give me um, an example of the... someone that I, who I could include, just like mentioned in the article? <sighs> yes, uh, I'd have to dig or up some... I, I'd have, the, the biggest, the, the easiest one would be Sean McCrary. He was the very first one to cam come out um, uh, from the United States Navy. How do you spell his name? Um, well, Sean and then McCrary. M. Smalls McCrary. I, okay. You, you have to look what it is, up. <laughs> I, I I don't know the small C, big yeah, C, R A R Y. I think. Uh huh. But you can listen to his podcast. I mean, I I think he spells okay. it. He, I think he spells it in there. But he's like literally was the first guy. He was a he was a godsend, and he was a a uh -huh. missile instructor for the United States Navy on the Sparrow missile system for ten years, and okay. he contacted me and said, "Look, we're targeting things at fifty nautical miles, which is longer than than ground miles." And he goes, he goes, the curvature of the Earth, he goes, we shouldn't be able to target that thing with with um, a beam radar. There's no way. It should be on the other side of the hill. And we are. And we're mm -hmm. hitting these things on a regular basis. We're not bouncing off the atmosphere. We're, we're going site to site to site. And mm -hmm. the, again, he was the one that kind of opened up the floodgates because then other people came out. It's like, well, if he can come out. I mean, we had a, um, there's a, um, in fact, there's one in there. You'll, you'll see a Dutch... She's uh, um, was an airline pilot for KLM, and mm -hmm. she was you know uh, you know, flew flew seven thirty sevens and seven fifty sevens and stuff, and she came on board and they benched her. The uh, the KLM doctors benched you know put, put her on medical um, you know they wouldn't let her fly until she renounced it, and she still won't. Mm. She's still not flying, and she's in there. She's in the list. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you go through it. It's, it's fascinating. There are a lot of very, very interesting people out there that, again, all say the same thing. They, the, 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 the common thing that they say is they couldn't see the forest for the trees, meaning mm -hmm. like, like with pilots, they all say, oh, yeah, when they're looking out the front of the window, it looks absolutely flat. But it can't mm -hmm. be because we're told it's a globe, right? And it can't be it can't be flat and so there's this weird paradox for for pilots where even though a lot of them you know know this it's like yeah you know what as long as i land the plane and nobody dies i'm probably fine besides who am i going to tell if you're a pilot who who do you go to do you go to the faa do you do you go to your airline 
if you tell anybody, you're done. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely done. I mean, you would be better off, and this is not an exaggeration, you would be better off telling your, your airline that you were chased by a giant UFO for two hours. At least mm. that one they would say, like, well, okay, we're still going to bench you, but at least we're not going to make fun of you. Mm-hmm. So. so are you saying that, like, what happened is you had free time, so you were looking into the different conspiracy theories, just, you know, like, because you were interested in them. Oh, yeah. I mean, and it, you, the truth, the truth is... You proved all of the ones that you... And then, but then you came to the flat earth and you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was basically it. It was like, well, I look at it, it was like, well, there's not much here, so I can I can crunch it in a weekend. You know, I'd be like, yeah, I, I can, because that way at least I'll have an opinion on it. I'll be somewhat versed on it. And the more yeah. I looked into it, the weirder it got. And that's when I decided I was going to make my own. And But the, nobody had made a, um introductory guide to Flat Earth. Mm-hmm. Everybody, mm-hmm. everything out there, if you remember like university books, it was like a 201 book or a 301 book. Nobody had made a 101 book on it. And so that's when I made the video series and I, I used almost no math at all. Uh, I made it very, very easy to understand and, and talked in very um, simple terms, and which was part of what I was trained to do when I was doing proprietary software, which was teach blue collar <laughs> factory workers how to run very dry, complex software by boiling, boiling mm-hmm. it down. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Um, do you remember the moment when you realized that, you know, Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it literally, it was February 10th, uh, 2015 at three in the morning. I remember exactly uh-huh. what the moment was. I, I, I was. I was turning it over in my head for about the millionth time. And then I thought, you know what? I've got it. I, I, I had reached my end. Of, that's, that's when I flipped over. When I said, you know what, mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of like the lawyer who switches sides, which never happens. <laughs> it's like a lawyer in the in the courtroom who says, yeah, you know what, I'm not going to defend my <laughs> client anymore. I I'm going to treat him as a as, as a hostile witness, and and you go after him. And uh, that's that's what happened. And that's why I literally got up, took a shower, and I could hear the entire narrative of the first clue in my head, in my own voice. I knew exactly. Mm-hmm. It was it was that it was a weird moment of clarity, where I mean I sat down. I've never written uh, so um, decisively, uh, and ever in my, in my life. I just sat down and I knew what every paragraph was gonna was gonna be. I didn't have to go back and change anything. I just wrote it all out. You know that first clue, and then when I stopped, I said, "Well, might as well narrate it." So I got a microphone and and narrated it, and then I said, "Well, might as well." I felt like Forrest Gump. And might as well, well, it's true. It's like, well, I got to the other side of the country. Might as well turn back. Um, And then I said, might as well attach slides to it. It took me all day to do this because I didn't know anything about video editing back then. And Uh then just use default settings for a lot of stuff because I had no idea what I was doing. And use a free movie player uh, creator from Microsoft and threw it up on, on YouTube and just said, yeah. What, mm-hmm. what could it hurt? And then again, put my, my real name and my phone number and my address and all this stuff because I wanted somebody to get a hold of me. I wanted somebody to say, okay, because I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't do it by myself. And then the opposite happened where, again, people were just helping at that point. It's like, oh, yeah, not only that, but take a look at this. And it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and again, yeah. like, that was the first thing that people did. Um, and I never even made a clue on it was... They said, get get a, a decent HD camera and start zooming in at things across a body of water. And hmm. I said, why? And they go, because you can't, you shouldn't be able to see it. And then that's, I mean, so many people started doing that and making videos and uh, the community just started growing and growing and growing and, and people started making their own channels. And I mean, there's channels out there way bigger than mine. And then you know, mm-hmm. people just go, we should do meetups. We should do conferences. <laughs> we should make all this stuff. And then the documentary people came in. Yeah, and it's just wild. Right. Um, so can you, since it was, you know, the first the first clue, can you just kind of give me the, like, your recap of how you figured that out? The first Briefly. clue? Well, the first <laughs> you know, I mean. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Um, 
the, the, you know, I'm sure it was, you know, not a quick discovery. No, no, there were several things that caught my eye. You know, the 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 southern flights. That was one of the first videos that that, that I really took a look at. Was the yeah. flights in the southern hemisphere didn't make any sense. Um, they were mm -hmm. all double and triple connections. Uh, they weren't flying over oceans that they should have been flying over. Um, the radar signature was being lost after 150 miles and it went to approximated or estimated mode, which is interesting because the, the, the director absolutely went out of his way to make sure he didn't show that. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, the director, by the way, the director of that film hated us by the end. He absolutely hated Flat Earth. He was a big science guy, but it worked in our advantage because no film festival would have taken him seriously if he had been one of us. Um, mm, which is how yeah. we, we spread. I mean, and he didn't even have any faith in the, the film. He's going, oh, wow, well, it's never going to make it into film festival. It made it into just about everyone they, they submitted to. It's like, well, it's never going to get purchased. It was purchased immediately by everyone. Um, the, only thing, the only thing we didn't get into was Sundance. Um, I don't even know mm. if they applied. But the thing, the, the thing that, that got me inspired enough to make the series was the mm. Antarctic Treaty believe it or not, which yeah. again, which they don't really talk about in the, in the film, which is Antarctica is, is, you know, now that we all know the term lockdown, a a Antarctica mm -hmm. is, is locked down. You can't do anything there. It doesn't matter how rich your com country is, how much, um, not only are, is your country, let's say you, you started, uh, you know, your own country. Uh, mm -hmm. The second you become an economic power, this piece of paper is put in front of you and says, oh, yeah, by the way, you got to sign this. What is it? Well, it's the Antarctic Treaty. What does it say? It says you can't ever go down there and set up shop for any reason ever. Even It's like, what do you mean ever? It's like ever. And in fact, it's not even up for review until 2041. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's the, un, the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. And the reason why that's strange is that the United States Navy in the 1950s came back and it's not secret information they said oh yeah this whole place is just made out of money it's just total nothing but resources i mean it's there's literally mountain ranges made out of coal and there's uranium and there's oil and there's gas and there's all sorts of other minerals and there's nothing to stop us there's no animal life there's no plant life the penguins on the coastline don't count um mm -hmm. there's there's nothing there is you know it's it's all for all for the taking and then almost immediately afterwards, again, when I think they found the, the outer barrier, they, they sealed it off. They said, yeah, nobody should ever go there ever, <laughs> ever. And here's, here's the thing, the, the part that threw me, because again, all, all the big things come down to money, uh, which is mm -hmm. uh, they're not even allowed to talk about it. That's the part that throws me. So if British Petroleum, for example, wanted to go down there. They could run full page ads and, and lobby people and run full page ads in the London Times every month and saying how great it would be, how much money the country could get, how many jobs we could create. They're not even allowed to do that. When does that happen ever? Some people at the highest level have been told, and you know, all you have to do is say it's under the guise of national security, that Antarctica mm -hmm. is off limits. And it just blows me away, especially, you know, you're from the States. You know, we can, you know, you, you, we can frack in your backyard tomorrow <laughs> if we wanted to. It takes yeah. nothing to do it. If anyone, yeah. you know, wa watch those wonderful, um, the documentaries Gasland and Gasland 2. You know, we, we've carved up the West. Any place we can frack, we have fracked. You know, the only reason they haven't done it up in my neck of the woods is there's nothing to frack. <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all rock and there's nothing down there. Thank God. Um, you know, they've... So they've research when um when did this happen when when was antarctica like oh when did it when did that hit me that that hit me in the beginning of 2015 as well i mean everything's happened really really quickly so the antarctic thing was probably in january of 2015 but i still wasn't confident enough to make the video series but i was really 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 close i just had a few loose ends to to tie up you know some i i needed i I basically needed to create explanations for every one of my own questions. I had to, I had to yeah. basically create, I had to answer every question I could come up with before I could go out there because I didn't want somebody to come at me with a question I'd never heard of. So, yeah. and I got most of them, you know, most of the questions, you know, of course the obvious ones is like, Oh, where do meteors come from? Or what about, you know, stars and planets and, you know, how do you describe, you know, the Antarctic sun and so on and so on. Those came with time. 
but most of them, yeah, I had already answered to, you know, for myself. And what is the main piece of evidence that that proved to you that, you know, Antarctica is like the the limit that would show us? The, the, <laughs> that... and, and by the way, the Antarctica, <laughs> let me clarify here. Antarctica was the big reason that got me to make the videos. The biggest piece of evidence now that we have, the one that we show people on a regular basis, that's long distance photography. Yeah. By far. I mean, if anyone ever oh. says, if anyone comes to me and says, what's your big, if you want to prove, you know, your, what's your biggest argument, your strongest argument for flat earth right now? Mm -hmm. It would, it wouldn't be Antarctica. I mean, Antarctica is fine, but most people don't get it. And it's like, well, it could be a coincidence or it could be happenstance or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the strongest argument we have is long distance photography. By far. 90% of the, the experiments we do, because it's so easy to do. Which is, um, again, they didn't talk about, they, you would have thought the documentary would have covered it since it is our strongest yeah. argument, but no. Um, which is, if you look off into the distance, you know, boats, boats eventually will go off and, and disappear off into the horizon, right? And you think, well, that's because they're going over the curve of the earth. And 10 years ago, you would have been right. Not now. What's changed now is HD technology. You see, some years ago, you could have taken the best camera we had out there and zoomed in on the horizon and it would just been fuzzy. You wouldn't have seen anything. But now with HD tech, you can zoom in with a camera that's less than $1,000 and you can see a boat that should have been gone. So, you know, you see the boat go off into this and it's like, well, it's gone. Then you zoom in with this thing. Well, it's there. Then you let go out again. You zoom in some more. Well, eventually you're going to run into a problem, with the, which is the boat is only so high off the water and your camera is only so high off the water and the curvature of the earth, if you believe mainstream science, we didn't come up with this, is eight inches per mile squared, which is eight inches per mile per mile. So eventually, what that means, I'll give you a quick example, um, 10 miles would be 10 times 10, which is 100 times eight inches, which is 800 inches. So there should be 800 inches of curvature at 10 miles. And it gets steeper and steeper mm. to where at like 50 miles, you're looking at almost 1,700 feet, which means you shouldn't be able to see anything lower than seven, you know, shorter than 1,700 feet. And we see objects all day long. And in fact, we, we can't, and, you know, the only, the only reason we have any limit to our viewing distance is because the atmosphere has thickness. You know, you're, you're basically breathing in a, a thin version of water. It's mostly nitrogen, a little bit of oxygen, but it has thickness. It's, it's no, not really much different from water at all. And things get blurry with distance. And so it's fascinating. And, and people, you know, we throw this at science, you know, science people all day long. They say, oh, it's refraction, it's Fata Morgana, it's, it's atmospheric lensing or whatever they want to come up with. And we've got some very compelling video and they don't know what to do with it, but, you know, they're still going to dig in their heels. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to talk about the Truman Show. Sure. <laughs> Which I saw it so long ago, but I mean, I remember the premise. So, yep. and you know, I'm a little bit confused about the dome yeah. theory, but I, I'm not a science or math person. You know, I'm a writer. Right. So if you could explain that to me and oh no I no that's fine video, so still confused. no 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 it's fine it's it's easy to explain so Sorry. the so the truman show is based the truman show is a 1998 movie starring jim carrey it's hard to believe it's 22 right. years old now in fact it blows me away i know i'm getting old because i saw it in the theater 22 years ago i saw it in the theater too did you <laughs> right on good yeah. for, good for you i did awesome I well it in Florence, actually, which is it, another weird it it yeah. is a it is a is a wonderful movie one of one of jim carrey's best and but the but the premise was really interesting and of course it, the premise wouldn't have worked now because we had so many channels the premise was if you build like a giant sports stadium so big and you have somebody yeah. born inside it you could tell them anything they want you know anything any anything you want you could you could make up a reality for them and they would believe it. And then you turn that into a reality television show. Well, back then it seemed like an interesting idea. Of course, it wouldn't have worked now, you know, it, because there's so many different channels. And people would be like, oh, yeah, he's being punked. Who cares? <laughs> no, no one would have watched the yeah. show. I mean, they, they definitely wouldn't have watched it 24 hours a day. But it was an interesting concept. So what happened um, was, you know, I, I, I went along the lines of, okay, what if the, the Truman Show building 
which I think was like 20 miles wide in the movie, which is still an engineering mm-hmm. marvel. I mean, the thing would have cost a billion dollars. Um, could you have made it bigger? And if you could have made it bigger, how many people could you have fooled more than just Truman? Could you have fooled, you know, 50 people, 100 people, 1,000 people? In fact, if you had the engineering capability, not us, obviously, uh, you know, but some civilization that's way bigger than us, if you could have made it much, much bigger, could you put a million people in there? And then, you know, at that point, it's just it's just relative. And then there was another movie I looked at, which was different than The Truman Show, which you may remember. Uh, and again, the documentary didn't cover it, which was The Village by um, M. Night Shyamalan. Did you ever watch that one? I don't think so. Okay, the premise no. The premise is easy. Um, uh, Sigourney Weaver was in it, and Jaquin Phoenix, and um, Cerise Ronan, I believe, and, and a few others. But the premise was is some very wealthy, let's say some billionaires, were tired of domestic violence, and they didn't want their kids growing up in domestic, domestic violence. So they bought a wildlife preserve. And they built a town inside it and kind of like an Amish town with no technology. And they just made up a date, you know, it was like they lived in the 1800s and they raised their kids in it. And then they told them, well, you can't go into the woods because there's monsters in the woods. And then they had actors playing monsters in the woods to, to make sure the kids didn't run off. Well, it's an interesting concept because they did this with almost no technology at all. And the kids believed they were living in the 1800s in a little Amish town in the middle of the forest. What I thought was interesting about that was, well, what happens when the parents die? And when the parents, after mm. the parents die, no one's lying anymore. That reality becomes more or less true. I mean, you could give all those kids lie detector tests and they'd pass them with flying colors. And they, they, they did that without a dome at all, without any sort of structure. So mm-hmm. so here's the premise. The premise is, if you had the ability to, to create a sound stage, a giant studio, right? A mm-hmm. massive, you know, because some of the sound stages we have are very, very big. But if, say, you could make mm-hmm. one that was very, very large, you could do just about anything you wanted on the inside of it. You know, uh, you could project stars and planets on the ceiling. And you could, you know, create islands and, you know, we're basically living in a, a soundstage in a giant and inside that soundstage is a giant saltwater lake. And inside that saltwater lake are a bunch of islands, which we call continents. And that's where we're living. And it's all com- mm-hmm. completely controlled and manufactured. And you know, there, as far as space goes, it's like, you know, people say, what about stars and the planets in space? I go, who said there was space? You look up at the sky, you're told there's space. But how, how do you know? In fact, I'll give you, I'll give you one more real quick, which is, um, you remember George Orwell? Yeah. Yeah. Guy wrote 1984. He, mm-hmm. he had a, he, he was really big on questioning science. He wasn't a flat earther, but he had this great quote. This is back in 1946. He said that he goes, it's interesting. He goes, you go to anyone on the street, you ask them how they know it's a globe. The world is a globe. And they'll just, they'll just come back and say, well, are you an idiot? We know it's a globe. Duh. It's been proven. He goes, yeah, really? How do you know? And, and then once you do, once you follow up that question, they start getting irritated because in 1946, NASA wasn't even founded until 1958. So how did everybody in the world know in 1946 that it was a globe? They didn't know. They were told. And if you're told this from generation to generation, generation, I mean, going back five centuries, well, then you were born into it. And that's, that's the concept. If you are born into a building and the powers that be tell you whatever it is, they'll, you will believe it. We believe our authority. Hell, we believe Santa Claus. And, you know, <laughs> th- till a certain age. And then we're, you know, some kid in the schoolyard said, there's no Santa Claus. And you cry. And it's, it's this big shattering of the illusion. But there are some things that we don't tell people. I mean, how many people are never told, or told not told for years and years and years, they were adopted? And that's that's the similar mm-hmm. thing we're talking about here, which is why we get so much pushback. It's like telling somebody when they're 30 that they're adopted. And, mm-hmm. you know, you go through, I mean, you have to go through the five stages of acceptance to, to deal with that. Anyway, sorry, I ramble. Um, no, so who built, who built the sound stage? Jim Carrey. No, no, he didn't build it. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> no, uh, well, that's just it. There, there's only two ways you can go with that. And so who built it? That's, that's a big, a big question. 
Um, you can only go one of two paths. One is a giant civilization that's much older and much more powerful than ourselves. Or some okay. sort of god. And, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to start naming names because, you know, there's five major religious houses here. And I think they've all got pieces to, to the same puzzle. Um, but really, when you get to that stage, you're kind of just splitting hairs because one man's ancient civilization is another man's deity. I mean, let's face it, if a giant golden spaceship landed somewhere and tall blue people came out, there'd be a group of people going, oh, wow, they do look like Avatar. And there's another people that would f like start building a church immediately. So, but whoever it was, it absolutely wasn't us. Um, you were talking about engineering, you know, on a scale that's, that's way beyond us. And that's tough for some people to understand, but I go, look, you know, to the, to the ant, when we build ant farms, we can build really elaborate things to us. It's no big deal, but to the ants, wow, <laughs> that's something. So you're, so, so you, you haven't figured out yet. Who built it? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I haven't figured. So you, don't want you, you say you say this like like you're disappointed. <laughs> um, I mean, I want to know. Well, no, everybody would know. want to know. I, here, here, I'll, I'll give you my, my take on it. I believe. <laughs> do I believe in God? Yes, I do. Uh, do I? Do I know exactly what God's motivations are? No, not necessarily. But at the same time. I think that we're here for a very deliberate reason. And I'll, I'll give you the reason, you know, sure, the one I came up with, which is that I believe that the universe runs off of novelty. And I'm a big fan of deciphering systems, you know, f trying to find the lowest common denominator of any system, and that will kind of give you the, the nature of it. And with this world, this world for some reason thrives and is almost completely based off of one thing which is conflict and by that i mean it doesn't matter how rich how powerful how beautiful how talented you are you always have something to complain about it doesn't matter who you looked up to who you idolize who you'd rather trade places with you know all rock stars want to be athletes all athletes want to be rock stars if you're a model you're constantly looking in the mirror worried about you know a wrinkle um if you're rich, you're constantly thinking about money and who's coming up behind you. Uh, and it just goes on and on. I mean, you, you, you complain about your servants. You complain about your, your limo drivers. You complain about everything. It doesn't matter. The perfect life, even, even Zen monks in the freaking Himalayas who might be actually <laughs> literally hovering off the ground still have to worry about mortality. Even if you can get past all the other stuff, the superficial stuff, you still have to worry about mortality. You are going to get old and eventually pass away. So if it's this world is 99% conflict, then what's outside of it has to be the opposite. I am, I am a believer in dualism, which is you can't appreciate one thing without the other. Meaning you can't you know, fully appreciate pain without pleasure uh, or the vice versa, hot without cold, light without shadow. You know, there's these opposites. What do you really know? That's why trust fund kids are always so screwed up. They never knew what it was like to be poor. Or, or to have not have every you know money at their disposal, and so I believe that outside this world is an unlimited world uh, that is nearly perfect. And I say nearly because eventually your imagination is going to run out. You know that it's based off of novelty, and that the only way you can fully appreciate an unlimited universe is to come to a world that is nothing but conflict, almost inescapable conflict. And you spend some time here, you fit, you know, you learn something. It's kind of like a school in a way. And mm. when you get out of it, you, you go back and it's cyclical. You know, you stay, you stay in the other place for a lot longer, but you have to come here to, to ground yourself, to remember what it was like. And so mm -hmm. that's my take. So are you saying that we have that ability to travel between the two realms oh yeah yeah i'm saying we're here deliberately i i'm saying it's no it's no accident the, forget about the big bang and dark matter and all that other junk i'm saying that you're here because you volunteered to be here which by the way gets you out of the clause uh, you know the the age-old question you know it's like what would you ask god if you ran into him and one of the common questions why do you let bad things happen to good people well it doesn't really count if you volunteered because if you volunteered, you signed the waivers, which you would, to come here, then uh, and have every chance, you know, to, to back out, 
then you're off the hook. It's like, look, you asked, you you absolutely, you know, wanted to be here. And it, it makes sense for me. Because again, your imagination can only go so far. In fact, I'll give you I'll give you a quick test. You, you seem pretty open minded. So and you don't have to answer. But what I try to tell okay. people is, is I say, give well, it's just something for you to think about, which is let's say you ran into a genie, you found a lamp, you rubbed a genie pops out. And you're smart enough to know it's like, I give you three wishes. And you go, hey, my first wish is a million wishes. <laughs> and he's like, damn it. And so you start rolling through your wishes and you start burning through them. Everything you could ever wish for. And it might take you 10 years to go through. It may take 100 years. could take thousands of years. The thing is, eventually you're going to run out of ideas. Nobody makes it to a million wishes. Why? Because your imagination eventually ends. Eventually your novelty runs out. You run out of ideas like anything. You know, there's a reason why uh, you're an American. <laughs> Why sitcoms don't go on forever? Because they mm. literally run out of ideas to write. It's like, you know, the, the, the max you could even go usually is about 10 years. Yeah, even on a good, good show. And even by then, you pretty much rehashed all sorts of stuff. So what do you do when you run out of, um, let's say, you know, you're, you're with this genie for 5,000 years. What do you do when you run out of ideas? Well, Genie comes to you. In fact, you ask the genie. It's like, what can I do here? I'm, I'm dying. I am bored out of my freaking tree. And I've done everything that I, can, that I can possibly think of. And the genie says, well, there is one thing we could do. But you're not going to like it. And it's like, really? What is it? I'll do anything. Well, I could send you to this place for 70 to 90 years, give or take. And it's really a pain in the ass. <laughs> limited lifespan, <laughs> all sorts of different ways to die. You're never completely happy. Bliss comes in very small doses. But when you're done, when you come back here, you will be super psyched and we can start this whole thing over again. It's like, wow, really? It's like, that sounds great. It's like, yeah, but there's a catch. What's the catch? Well, the catch is you can't remember that you even asked me this. In fact, everything we've been doing up until now, you can't remember when you go there because it completely wipes out, you know, the, the relevance of it. You know, if you knew, mm. again, it's the age old question, if you knew there was an afterlife, a wonderful place outside of this world, if you absolutely knew that, you would bail <laughs> the first, first sense of conflict that you had, you know, it's like bad prom date, gone, <laughs> bad parenting, gone. You would just leave. I mean, suicide would be the, the norm. And so, mm -hmm. and so, you know, you think, oh, wow, I don't know if I want to do that. And it's like, yeah, I'll take your time. I'll be here. And he just sits there and waits for you. And eventually you come back to him and it's like, all right, do it. He snaps his fingers. Welcome to earth. There you are. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> so you're saying outside of our Truman show is like, heaven or the afterlife or yeah bliss, yeah i mean whatever you whatever, whatever you, want. you know whatever we you know yeah. the various religions call it yeah yeah right? heaven nirvana shambhala uh take take your pick but the point is is that it's not here it is not a world full of conflict it is uh, an unlimited universe and and do i do i think it's necessarily again some people's like oh you know it's choirs singing endlessly and angels and and all the food is white for some reason, I don't know if I'd, I'd go along that, but if that's your heaven, hey, sure, great. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so so I was also intrigued by this idea of like space travel. So with this theory, you're saying that that doesn't exist, like the outer space. Oh, it's star. it's way worse okay. than than you know. <laughs> space <laughs> space travel, unfortunately. Um, was created because of the problem that human beings have with what I call the fence. Meaning human beings do not, do not like being confined. Kind of like you right now. You do not like being <laughs> confined. And this is, and you're in kind I of just, well, I mean, you're kind of in a house arrest type thing. You know, I mean, in fact, yeah. there are, in fact, there are people under house arrest with ankle bracelets right now who actually have it probably easier than some countries that are, that are dealing with this right now. But uh, so people don't don't like confinement. And so the example I give is the wildlife preserve, which is you, you take a thousand acre wildlife preserve, put put a bunch of buffalo in it. Right. 
and and make sure you know there's a fence that goes around the outside do the buffalo care about the fence nope they could care less they got a stream they got grass they got trees they are really really happy really really great and you could do as many buffalo as you want in there you could put hundreds of them mm-hmm. if you wanted to you put a dozen people in that same thousand acre wildlife reserve they're only going to care about one thing and that's the fence and that's the wall it's like who made the fence why are we on this side of the fence who's on the other side of the fence did we do something to anger the fence? Maybe we should sacrifice things to the fence, grab some buffalo, and next thing you know, a, re- a religion is born. Um, to get rid of that, you have to create you know, the solar system. You have to create the, the idea of planets and, and everything. And the space thing is just the natural extension of that. So um, the Americans in, this, in the Soviet Union back in the day in the whole space race, um, you, you militarize space, which is what they did for the longest time, you go to the moon as fast as humanly possible, make it seem boring, like there's nothing there. You come home, you shut the whole thing down, and no one ever goes since. And it's mind-blowing to me, absolutely mind-blowing that the general population... And then you just tell people every couple of years or so, or every president, that's like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to go back. We're going to go back. Every president since Reagan. Reagan, Bush, or Senior Bush, Clinton... Uh, the other Bush, Obama, Trump, they, they've all said the same thing. It's like, oh, yeah, we're going back. In fact, I've had arguments with science people. I go, when are you going back? Right? Because, you know, we haven't been back supposedly since 1972. And they all said the same thing. Oh, like real soon. I go, really? Because I've been hearing that for 40 years. Real soon. Nobody's going anywhere. No one's even building rockets. They're, they're going to the moon. Um, and the reason why you, you fake the moon mission is because you have to. You don't want private corporations getting involved and you limit the Mm -hmm. private corporations access. You limit what they can do. So Virgin Galactic and SpaceX and Blue Horizon, especially SpaceX. Oh, that whole dog and pony show. Uh, But Mm -hmm. that's that's you because what you don't want is you don't want the military contractors that build the parts for NASA to team up with somebody else. You don't want like Frito-Lay to team up with Boeing and build (laughs) and build a rocket. Because they're going to crash. Eventually, they're going to run in and run into whatever the upper barrier of this thing. It's like, why can't we get to the moon? And you don't want that. And so you just delay things as long as possible until you can figure out how to either release it to the public or auger civilization into the ground to where it becomes a moot point anyway. Okay, so then all of the like space. Yep. Mm, all of I it. Don't know, like missions or yep, everything whatever. From everything. Economy, all of that is um, fabricated. All of it's fabricated. However, does that mean that everybody that works at NASA and the European Space Agency and JAXA and all that, does that mean that all of them are in on it? No. No. As a fact, 99% of the people that work at these corporations don't know anything because they don't have to. It's compartmentalization, which is, you know, you polish, you polish your, your fuel system, you work on a capsule, you work on this, you work on that. All those individual mm-hmm. pieces don't need to do anything. If you're building a rocket, great, build a rocket. You can launch it and ditch it in the ocean somewhere. The only guys that need to know anything are the telemetry guys, the guys that send back the data once it gets out of visual range and say, oh, yeah, here's where the rocket is right now. Well, you can make up any data you want at that point. You can, you can, because you can't see it. It's out of visual range. And um, do they do, but I'll give you a, a quick clarification. Do the astronauts know that they're faking something? Yes, they do. I think the Apollo astronauts knew more than they probably should have, which is why they all became alcoholics and never talked to anybody ever. Um, but other people that, that supposedly are inside the space station, they're just Air Force employees. Remember, all these guys are, are Air Force officers um, and women. Mm-hmm. They, um, they're told, you know, they sign the waivers and they're told, OK, uh, you have to fake this. Now, then the question, you know, if they ask, like, why? Well, that's above your pay grade. We've all heard that term. It's kind of like um, sending a spy out to shoot someone. Right. The spy is like, OK, mm-hmm. here's your target. Here's where he's going to be. You hide here. Shoot him. The spy does not get to know the political intrigue and the backstory behind this, even though I'm sure it's very deep and complex and could be made into a movie. The spy doesn't get to know this. Mm -hmm. The the spy just gets the target. He's paid for to do a job. He is a military employee. No different than the astronauts now. So the astronauts now just, uh, you know, do their job. And in fact, I even had a chance to square off against one of them, one of our own, Terry Virts, um, for a, a UK program. 
And uh-huh. and people are, you know, they were saying, you know, are you calling Terry a liar? And I'm going, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm saying he's a colonel in the United States Air Force. You don't get to go that high without keeping a secret. And plus, even if he did want to say something, the military has different rules than what we have. You know, the, the, when you get brought up on treason, you don't go to a normal court. You don't get to get a lawyer. <laughs> they, they, they lock you in a room and throw away the room. You, you're done. So it's, it's very, and they're very, very strict about that. That's one of the first things they teach you in the military. They go, if you reveal military secrets, we can do anything we want with you. And so that's great motivation because people say, well, why are there any whistleblowers, astronauts? It's like, uh, because you do psychological profiles on these guys and you know, plus you tap their emails and phones, you know, all these guys, you know, you watch them like hawks just in case. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, that, no, that's very interesting yeah. like wow i don't I'm like hmm. i know i know right again i went through so, okay so like, i have a question yeah. and please excuse my ignorance no. but so whenever you know the first astronomers whenever that was i don't know you probably know when that was i don't know when that was. back in the day but yeah. so, so this dome i mean it's been around that like this kind of how do i want to say it Basically, when they created the dome, yeah. whenever that was, yeah. they're like, we know that people are going to want to know what's up in the sky. Yes. So we need to create something uh, that these, you know, astron- they're, they're like predicting. People are going to be curious. So we need to make it look like there's something. Some sort of solar system. Yes. There. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, like, why, why a solar system? Like, why couldn't it just be black or well you don't and that's a great and honestly that is one of the better questions i've gotten in a long time uh no one's ever in fact no one's ever said that said it quite like that it's very very good why can't you just leave it black excellent um there's several reasons for that and i'm not going to go into the biblical side of things or or rip it off the bible too much but you got to remember that the clock first first and foremost the clock is or wow (laughs) the sky is he was giving it away there. The sky is a giant clock. <laughs> the, the sky is a giant clock system. That's all it is. It is okay. a giant clock. It, it predates no, numbers. It predates language. In fact, your culture doesn't even have to have language at all. And you can figure out how the sky works. You just watch it every night. Back in the old days, that's all they did anyway. And you can figure out what yeah. cause. Like Machu Picchu. The what? Right? Like the, the people who built Machu Picchu. Yes, 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 yes. And, and you remember the Zodiac, you know, they, they created the Zodiac and the whole horoscope system. And so the sky is just a, basically a clock. But why not, you know, like anything, why not make it ornamental? So it's a very pretty clock. You know, the stars have different colors and, you, you know, the planets are doing their own thing. Uh, and the, uh, the sun and the moon are, are their own little things as well. But that's really all it is. You know, you can use it for signs and wonders as well. You know, the eclipse every once in a while, make people go ooh and ah. Uh, you know, decorate the moon a certain way. And, you know, it's, it's you know, the moon is basically just a giant night light and the sun is a big incandescent ceiling light. And that's all, that's all you really need. So, yeah, to leave it black doesn't do much for the imagination. Part of this world is to, cre- to inspire to give people like like a like a college you know or university universities not only do you learn things but it's supposed to inspire you to do things to learn and and create and express yourself and that's what this world really is i mean and the sky what a great way to do it you know people got a lot of time on their hands back in the day before cell phones and so they're looking at the sky and they're they're coming up with stuff i mean think of the zodiac stories you know just the the stories that they came up with just on on some of the shapes of the stars i mean they they went way out of bounds it's like really that guy looks like an archer not really that looks like a crab not so much but if you want to go with it hey great um so yeah that's why you don't leave it black but in back in the or you know the early early versions if you believe some of the old myths and legends that was black Mm -hmm. you know that it what there wasn't really much up there you know in fact there wasn't even a a sun and the moon the sky just got light and dark which is interesting because it's like, well, how can it get light and dark without a sun and the moon? Well, remember, if you're 
the gods, you know, of the sky, you can make and mm -hmm. anything you want. What's interesting is our early video game sim simulations. That's exactly what we did. We didn't have the sun and the moon. We just made the sky light or dark. And as it got more advanced, as we got more advanced, we created, you know, the sun and the moon, and then put in stars and had them rotate and do all the fun stuff. So. So it's it's the clock. Yep. Yeah. Yes. It's a clock. It's a clock, that. and it's um. And it's a, w a way to inspire people. How's that? It's a, it's a pretty, it's a very or ornamental clock, which is meant to give people things to think about. And I guess people need this, like, inspiration or things to think about because otherwise, like, the reality in this, you know, stage or whatever, you know, whichever we want to call it, yeah. it would be too brutal. So then people need something to like. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Oh, I mean, all right. All right. That sunset. You know, that was beautiful. Okay. There you I go. Guess I feel better now you're that. thinking you, <laughs> you are asking so many better questions than other people. You're absolutely right. The sun. Oh, the, thank you. The, no, it's true. The, the sun, the sun, sunsets inspire people to no end. How many people have freaking painted sunsets? My God. <laughs> Um, the stars, people have done all sorts of stuff with the stars, the moon, you know, one of the most photographed objects of all time and so on and so on. Uh, it does. And, you know, it's just the little things that inspire people. Of course, those, that's just the stuff in the sky. You know, then it's the other things in the ground, you know, your canyons, your forests, your lakes, your rivers and so on and so on. But it's all part of the part of the same thing, which is to get people to think about, you know, it's it's part of the escapism. You know, back before prescription drugs and the crack pipe, you know, people you know, <laughs> needed escapism, you know, and they did that usually through the arts, uh, the, the big forms of the arts, which are um, pictures, sculptures, music, dance and literature. And that's really all you had. And you you created, you know, people people spent time in museums. They spent time painting. They spent time drawing, singing. And doing all those things and you need as many things as possible to inspire those people you know i have never said any of this stuff in any other interview so i'm glad i'm glad you asked this stuff <laughs> and i have done i've well, done hundreds of these things well good thing we recorded it huh yes yeah <laughs> you recorded it yeah <laughs> so then you know you'll send it to me for the article but then i mean you can yeah yeah no i mean it's yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really, you know, I hadn't given it that much thought, but, but you kind of prompted it, which is, yeah, you know, it's just, it's like, why not blackness? It's like, because blackness, it's, it does nothing for people. I mean, they stare at it and they just get lost. In fact, it probably prompts more despair than anything else. Having little pinpoints, pretty pinpoints of light in the middle of the blackness. Oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, then people just stare. It's like, what are those things? You know, and, and people have been asking that forever. They're still asking that, despite what science says. People are still asking. It's like, what are they? <laughs> I mean, there's some people even today that, that are absolutely, you know, say, oh, they're angels. And they're actually, they're marching around the sky. And uh, it's like, really? That's kind of cool. Or they're, you know, sentient beings. And there's all sorts of fun <laughs> stuff revolving just, just around the stars. Mm -hmm. and, and there's entire mm -hmm. religions based off of the sun. I, you know, right. which shouldn't really surprise anybody. I mean, it is pretty spectacular. Mm -hmm. so. What else hmm. you got? But we don't, but we don't know who, like, who came up with all of these ideas. You're saying, you well, still, you, still it, don't know. It, but you have your theory. Well, I mean, again, who, who came up with it? I, <laughs> that will only be revealed with time. You know, is it is yeah. it God or, you know, it, it's something I kind of I tongue in cheek said, which was, is it, it it may not be God, but whoever it is, is one step closer to knowing God's phone number than we are. Yeah. And again, we, we can do it's amazing what we can do in simulations now. Forget about planetariums. I mean, planetariums, we can do a lot of stuff. But in the computer simulations that we can build, we've been building for the last 15 years. We can do all of this stuff, but just on a much, much smaller scale. And if you had a big enough computer, we could build a world size simulation if you wanted to. I mean, you know, the same size as, as this world, if you wanted to. Uh, we're we're mm -hmm. really, really close. And uh, in fact, the um, it's interesting that we run into some of the same 
issues, you know, I, I don't necessarily like to go into the simulation stuff as much because most people don't mm -hmm. get it. I mean, the Matrix is 20 plus years old and, and people still don't really understand yeah. the concept. But we're, there are there are things that are happening in physics in our world, which we do in the simulated world now. And you're wondering, okay, what's the connection? You know, where where is that going from? If, you, if you're ever curious, watch the movie called um, The 13th Floor, which was basically mm -hmm. uh, based on a, a book from the 1960s. Or, yeah, 1960s. Um, the, about a simulation within a simulation. And that is, which is why I don't think we'll ever get that to that point. You know, the entertainment companies are, are, to, are completely trying to get a way to or find a way that we can tap into our mind to, to where we can, you know, jump into a simulation like a holodeck or a matrix type thing. But once you do that, this mm -hmm. world, this world becomes irrelevant. So I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think that's allowed. I don't think that's part of the rules. I think you can get close, but I don't think you can do it because then it just blurs the lines. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, yeah, who, well, like, go ahead. That gets into like artificial intelligence and oh, yeah. virtual reality and all that. Oh yeah. Yep. And again, <laughs> again, most people don't, you know, which is why uh, when I started on this, you know, the, 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 the general public doesn't understand that whether you're playing Minecraft or GTA or Fortnite or any of that stuff, it's all built on a perfectly flat box world. You know, it's, it's a flat, yeah. there's no curve. It's just a flat world with, um, with a box. There's no dome. Um, computers can't think in circles. They can't even draw circles. They can only draw tiny little squares. And um, they, so when it comes to the sky, it's literally a box that they have to bend, you know, ever so slightly with resolution to where it makes you think. It's like, oh, those are clouds. It's like, nah, not so much. They're not clouds. Uh, so yeah, but, but people don't get it. So I had to start off with something easy, which was it's flat. You know, it's a, it's a flat, mm. it's a flat world and it's probably enclosed, but even your, your, your more progressive scientists will tell you, they'll say, well, if it's flat and it's closed, it's probably digital. It's probably virtual. It's like, yep, probably is. And again, that's not diminishing any religion whatsoever. I'm saying that God is a programmer, you know, because God is, you know, mm. we, we didn't invent programming, <laughs> You know, whoever we're, we're not, we didn't originate anything. There's nothing new under the sun. We, you know, we rediscovered it, but uh, whoever built this world, probably it's real to us. And it's weird to t even talk about it because, you know, ev you know, you can touch things and breathe and everything's, everything seems very, very real, but outside of this world, it's not that real, but we can't be outside of that world, you know, outside this world and inside at the same time. So it's this weird paradox. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wait, so it's kind of like we're living in the holodeck? <laughs> yeah. Yes, from Star Trek Next Gen. Absolutely. As a matter of yeah. fact, I'll, I'll give you a great, great quote. Um, so you remember the, the comic book strip Dilbert? You remember that? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So the creator of Dilbert, really smart guy, he wrote a foreword to a book, and I read it, and it was very, very insightful. He said that the last invention we will ever make is the holodeck because once you make it and, and he was taught he was kind of i think he was kind of irritated at the whole star trek next gen concept which was once you make the mm -hmm. holodeck you don't have to aspire to do anything because you could just create it <laughs> you know <laughs> so it's like if you're not an officer in starfleet you can just go into the holodeck and you become um, an officer in starfleet in fact you would just work the bare, it would, he said it'd basically be the end of civilization as we know it, because people would work just the bare minimum to pay for their holodeck time. And that's all they'd care about. You know, you'd live, you'd live in a tiny little apartment, tiny, you know, with, all you'd care about is making enough money so you can jack back into your, your holodeck thing or whatever the holodeck is. And which is, you know, the, the, the hypocrisy of that was, you know, the, whenever you were watching Star Trek Next Gen, the holodeck was always free. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, well, we'll go to holodeck three. There's nobody there. Are you kidding? You're in deep space. <laughs> Everyone would be in the holodeck all the time. And it would be really funky, by the way. It's like, so what, what are the limits? You know, cause it's always squeaky clean. What are the limits of holodecks? You know, can you go in and kill people? Can you go in and, and have a harem and orgies? Can you do any of that stuff? You know, can you do, go in and do a bunch of simulated drugs? <laughs> it was like, 
I, I know the comp says, well, well, we've evolved. Our culture has evolved beyond money. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> so you've evolved beyond everything, but you still have holodecks? Yeah, not buying it. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> it's so, I mean, you mentioned the Dilbert creator, but is there um, a thinker or a philosopher or a book or, I mean, there are probably a lot, but maybe one that is sort of your like oracle of okay like oh yeah 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 there was a book yeah yeah you're absolutely right there was a book that really really inspired me um well there's two books um it didn't have to do with simulations um but there was a a book that mark twain never published called the mysterious the mysterious stranger Okay. But that one that one inspired me as far as human nature and how perception, which was the mysterious stranger story. You can you can find them online, or if you can't find it, let me know and I'll I'll send one to you. Um, but not very long. It was I think it was set in the 1500s in Europe. Uh, the devil mm-hmm. approaches a bunch of adolescent boys in in a small mm-hmm. town in Europe, and. He basically teaches them how, you know, the, the nature of humanity. And he kind of goes through the whole, you know, the, 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 the story of, you know, be careful what you wish for. You know, if, if you wish, if you wish, you ask a wish from the devil, you got to be careful because he's going to twist it on you. You know, he's going to, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you want this? Oh, okay. But here's the, here's the catch. Here's the catch. And through that, he showed them what human nature was all about and how people were, you know, basically, you know, greedy and lazy and uh, mm-hmm. very judgmental. And, you know, they were, you know, all sound and fury signifying nothing type type of deal. Very, very fascinating story. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not even really sure what the point was <laughs> other than, you know, it was, it was basically just the, it, it, what I think was interesting was I think Mark Twain wrote it. He was friends uh, this is not not speculation. He was friends with Nikola Tesla towards the end of his life, and mm. I think Nikola Tesla showed him some things where it's like, yeah, here's part of how the world really works. And I think Mark Twain, who's you know a humorist, he writes lighthearted stories. Mm-hmm. He he, that was a that was a dark story for him, and then, again, it was never published. But the other one that I liked that really caught my caught my eye was back in the 80s late 80s it was um called the wizardry cursed and the wizardry cursed wizard wizardry cursed and okay. it was about um computer hackers in a world of magic and i know that sounds super nerdy but you got to remember this was the late 80s and there was no the matrix wouldn't even be for another 10 years at least uh, and it was basically, you know, hackers creating a virtual reality that was tied into a fantasy, sort of a Lord of the Ringsy type stuff. And it really got my mind going into, it was a great imagine, you know, wonderful imagination story. And, uh, mm-hmm. that really, those, those two really, really got me. You know, one, one was again, both fictional, but both very, you know, got me going down certain roads, which I don't think I would have gone on my own. Um, the classics and the the other philosophers and that, and, eh, you know, I, I like people that are willing to break break down the wall and, and see what's on the other side and, and see what, uh, you know, the potential, you know, go take take the imagination to the to the limit. Take it as far as you can mm-hmm. until you know, there's no gas left in the tank type stuff. So those are the two that really yeah. is that what you were kind of looking for? Yeah, yeah, but um, you'd also mentioned nineteen eighty four. Nineteen eighty George Orwell. Yeah, that... you know, I've read it a couple times, and I've watched the movie a couple times. I thought the movie was actually quite good. Um, yeah. And and if they remade it even now, I don't know if they could because you know politically correct would step in and they would probably change up too much. Yeah. Uh, nineteen eighty four. The very and I read it of course you know I was in high school in 84 so it was required reading go figure and because it's like oh well, they should you know and, and it was the the whole term Orwellian what I took out of it in fact here's the, the Star Trek they, they did a kind of a version of it Here, here's the part which which is very appropriate even now 
uh, mm. which was the, the uh, I'll give you a quick Star Trek version of it, which is the uh, the four lights, five lights type deal, which is mm. um, Captain Picard was was captured by the Card- Cardassians, I think, and he was tortured and he was finally mm. rescued at the end. And he went through the torture process. They were trying to get information out of him. And there was there was four lights up above. And every time they asked him a question, if he was lied, and eventually they just said, how many lights are there? And every time he said four, they they'd beat the hell out of him. And mm-hmm. the very end of the, the show is very, very interesting. Again, the perception where he's going, you know, he goes, you know, the thing that scared me the most, it wasn't the pain. It wasn't the suffering. He goes, it was, he goes at the end, he goes, I could see five lights. And mm. the, what I mean by that is, is that in, if you are, you know, if you push something, the narrative into somebody's head enough. You can push just about anything that you want and the conditioning will sink in. And that got me into, uh, you know, it, it, that, that was a quick jump when I was looking at the globe, for example. And I don't know if they talked about that in the documentary, but which was you put a globe in somebody's classroom, especially in America. You know, you put that in the cl- corner of the, gla- the classroom below the American flag and you sit that there for 12 years, assuming they, they make it through high school. How, how are you going to beat that conditioning? I mean, when they get out of high school, the globe's their home. That little blue cardboard toy, that's their home. And you try talking them out of that. That's tough to do because just because they were told this over and over and over again. And they, in fact, they didn't have to tell them as much as they were shown that image. I mean, that is classic conditioning. And Mm -hmm. that is is something that we, we have carried through in the media, you know, over and over. You can spin a story and the media has gotten so razor sharp that now we can tell people just about anything in the media and they will believe it. I mean, I walk around the streets and people are like, oh yeah, did you hear such and such? I'm going, you know, you can, which is why, and, and people, you know, you're over there, but you've, you've heard the term fake news, you know, in the last few years recently. And people say, well, no, there's no fake news. I go, really? And again, I'm not, I don't know what your political leanings are, but I'll, I'll give you the quick example. I'll say, really? Everything they say on Fox News is absolutely true. And everything they say on NBC News is absolutely true. <laughs> well, <laughs> depending on who you s- say that to, people will be like, you know, you know, depending on, you know, let's say you're a Democrat. If I say that Fox News thing, you're going to go, no, <laughs> they lie all the time. I go, oh, really? You know, because you have the same thing on the other side. And so, mm-hmm. but yet, you know, there are people that absolutely believe that, that whatever, literally whatever is said on Fox News is the gospel and anything that it says on CNN is the gospel. We have this weird polarization side of things. So yeah, 84 was just the, it, it was way ahead of its time. And in fact, I think Orwell probably cheated somehow. I don't know how he got it to look into our future, but it was very, very <laughs> close to where you could, if you wanted to, you can rewrite history. Um, uh, I'll give you, I'll give you a real quick example here. Um, there was a, uh, a, a famous court case some years ago, I think in the late eighties, early nineties where, um, I think it was Hasbro. Yeah. Pretty sure it was Hasbro. They were the guy, the, you remember GI Joe, the, the, you know, the greatest American yeah. hero, mm-hmm. they were mm-hmm. making commercials and they were showing their own commercials in between their own cartoon shows and the commercials were using the same animation as the cartoon shows and they were running back-to-back episodes so it became like this two-hour commercial and Mm -hmm. they were um, basically brainwashing kids into throwing tamper tantrums if they didn't if the parents wouldn't buy them the toys it was made to where congress had Mm -hmm. to step in and they uh the congress said yeah you can't run your freaking commercials in between shows and use the same animation it's brainwashing and they was literally called the the Congress was writing the acts. You know, it was called the GI Joe clause, and it was in it was known that way for a number of years. And then the mm-hmm. lawyers of Hasbro got involved and went through the internet and scrubbed it to where it is gone. It is absolutely gone. You cannot find any mention of the why the the it's now in the, like the child's digital protection act or something like that but you cannot find any mm-hmm. reference to that and that's not the first occasion um uh real quick the you remember uh you've heard the term drinking the kool-aid right yeah okay, you know mm-hmm. you remember what that's from mm, no okay 
for drinking the Kool-Aid was was because in the late 70s, there was a religious cult leader <laughs> who set up shop down in oh, yeah, in French Guyana, and he had all of them drink um, a cyanide-laced Kool-Aid, and they all died be before the military showed up as this big, you know, we'll just kill ourselves before I'm, I'm arrested. And Kool-Aid was so worried about this, because as you can imagine, a lot of people didn't buy Kool-Aid after that, that their lawyers tried to spin it, that it was actually one of their rivals, Flavor-Aid, that was actually it was part of that and flavor aid lawyers got involved and they went back and forth and back and forth to where finally the the supreme court or whoever it was maybe a, a appellate court got involved and said and said look neither of you guys are off the hook they probably used both so shut up <laughs> and that was it but if kool-aid would have had their way they would have they would have erased that from history so yeah rewriting history uh, yeah everyone wants to do it but very few can so do you, so speaking of rewriting history, do you think it's possible that like, I mean, I've seen that the flat earth group are growing. Yeah. It seems. Yeah. Uh, do you think it's possible that there might be like a shift in consciousness yes. or like do you see as like the future and like, I don't know, you know, there's this this virus maybe <laughs> you know maybe something is gonna i don't know no 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 maybe you're you're not wrong be. you're not wrong there are people over here all that okay two things one yeah absolutely do i believe in a shift in consciousness yes it's something uh that i uh, that i called back in the, 2015 called the hundredth monkey effect uh have you ever heard of that mm. hundredth monkey effect no oh, hundredth monkey effect is brilliant so these scientists were working with some monkeys out on some islands off of Japan and, and scientists will come back and say, oh, no, it's a myth. It's like, no, it's not a freaking myth. You came up with it. We didn't. Where they were showing monkey, they were giving monkeys potatoes. They were watching them. It was like, what are the monkeys doing? Right. And they were dropping them off on the beach and the monkeys were like eating potatoes with sand. And it's like, well, eh, sand wasn't really great. You know, eating sand's never a good thing. So some of the monkeys figured out that, well, I'll just wash it off in the water before I eat the potato. And this was happening more and more. But what was interesting was when they hit about the hundredth monkey, when that mm -hmm. monkey washed that, his hands off and the, you know, the, the potato off the sand, he, um, sand off potato. Wow. He, all the other monkeys at that point knew how to do it. Meaning every monkey, it seemed to be this mass upload where it's like something benefited the monkeys. And so let's not, let's not learn it piecemeal. They all learned it. And what was interesting was the islands that were next to these islands also learned it instantly. Every group mm. of that monkey seemed to, it was this, this giant push up the system, which is what we do in software. You know, we do, you know, these mass updates and, you know, if mm -hmm. it benefits the species, maybe that's what happened. The question is, does that work with humans? Does that work with human beings? I think it does. I think that if you mm -hmm. got enough people involved in uh, a particular topic, I think you run into these common things that we, you know, that we absorb as a community. And so, yeah, could we be dealing with a, with a consciousness? Yes. And could, by the way, if you want to circle back, could this be tied to the, to the virus in some way? Yeah. Why not? I mean, it, we, the virus doesn't make any sense and not to go off on a rant here, but look, if you know anything about viruses, the, the what's happening what we're seeing here does it's first off it's way too slow way too slow um comparison i mean everything we've ever looked at and I, in, in this case the movies are right and i don't care if you're talking about stephen king's the stand or contagion or whatever it is once it gets on that first international flight and you're breathing the same air and you're touching the same things and you're sharing the same freaking bathrooms 200 people in a plane come on once that <laughs> once that lands, I mean, people don't like doing that, and when everyone's healthy, <laughs> let alone this is gross. Uh, I don't care if you're in first class or not. Um, once it lands, those people get off that. You know, you land at JFK, you land at um, San Francisco, you land in New York. I mean, those people get off those planes and get onto other planes, and they fly to other regional airports, and it spreads through the entire world in under two weeks. And everybody, that's how it works. I mean, I mean, the stand, it was like, yeah, everybody died in like a really, really short amount of time because once it hits the airport, it's over. It, it's over. You're, you're done. I mean, every state in the, in the union has some sort of major airport that gets to fly, you know, to another country. And so if you, if this came in, we'll just hypothetically say from, from, um, 
China, right? And around Christmas, well, we're, next week is April. <laughs> it's like how how is everything going so slow? You know, why do we have states literally have states in you know a bunch of them in the United States with, with one death? Uh, it just doesn't make any, it make any sense. I think it's part of something bigger. I think, and again, I'm a conspiracy guy, but I think it's part of something bigger because everything that's being done, uh, and this is not just America, obviously, it's, you know, there's, I've lost count of the countries that are on lockdown. Um, I think everything that's been done seems to be pushing in one direction, which is to get people to go home. College students going home, uh, every level of students, as a matter of fact, middle school, grade school, high school, they're all going home. You're not working. You don't get to go to work. You don't get to go anywhere fun. You only get to go and get groceries and medicine and maybe hardware goods, maybe. And mm -hmm. the whole thing is to, to get people to go home. So why? Why there, there seems to be for me, um, I've been pushing this for the last few weeks. There seems to be an event that's going to follow this. And there that people have to be home for it, whatever the event is. And I'm not trying to make that necessarily sound ominous, but that's what I would do. One of, one of the things I'm, I'm good at is putting myself in the other people's shoes. And this is a move I would do. It's like, if you're worried that the population may freak out over your event, you want to minimize the freak out potential. You want to minimize the disruption. And the easiest way to do that is to get everybody home. Now, of course, there's bad things that can go along with being home, you know, especially if you're part of like a domestic abuse situation. But but for the most people, I mean, you know, you, you don't what you don't want is you don't want kids at school that, that mothers have to run off and go get. Um, you don't want people running at work, you know, working 40, 50 miles away. You don't you don't want that. So I think we're in that mm -hmm. window where either they have to decide to move forward with the event or they don't. But whatever the event is, it's obviously not limited to America. Uh, because, you know, every every country, I mean, you can't find toilet paper basically anywhere in the world right now. So, yeah, yeah there you go. How's that? So the event could be from outside. The event could be from yeah. outside. As a matter of fact, um, you know, being that we've been, it, it was something I kind of predicted a couple of years ago, which I said, look, the only way you're going to stop flat earth from spreading is if you come up with something bigger. Something, something that distracts people, and I'm, I have been quoted many times on this. Something so big that that people are, will, for a while, not think about flat Earth. Now, what can you do with that to your advantage? Who knows? You know, maybe there will be some wonderful light show in the sky. You know, maybe this is the big reveal. You know, maybe if if a civilization figures out where they are, maybe that's the trigger. You know, all all simulations are be, are, are built on thresholds and triggers which is when something happens, then this happens, you know, if then go to, and maybe that's it. Maybe there was this magical number with enough people question their reality that the reality then becomes apparent. Uh, it's, it was just something I came up with. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's how it would work. If that's the case, the old saying, and that is when all those students are in their seats, that's when the, that's when the teacher arrives. So that's that's what I, that's what I think we're looking at right now. I think we're in that window where uh, I don't think they can do a physical lockdown because it would create chaos. There was something I, I came up with. It was like I called it the smallest box theory, which was if you can get people to if you can close down everything, that would be the ultimate. But you can't close down everything. Because if you told people, like, for example, like out in your neck of the woods, if you said, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to close the grocery stores starting tomorrow night at midnight for for a week for whatever reason you know mm -hmm. to reduce the spread what do you think people are going to do that people are going to go straight to the grocery stores and they are going to take yeah. everything you know they it's not going to be just paper products or beef or or pasta <laughs> they will empty the stores and you won't have there won't be enough people to stop them and uh so you don't want that so you know maybe they're maybe that's what what they're where we are now it's like this is the closest i think we're going to get voluntary lockdown most people are home. Most businesses are closed. Uh, it's it's probably, I think, as good as you're going to get. I, I just can't see. Now, they could pull back from this, but I don't see why. I mean, it seems like they've committed They've committed to pass the point of no return. But uh, I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. so. so there could be a big reveal. I, um, I would. I, I would. If it was me and if I was, you know, overseeing the... Um, the the welfare of this place 
if you want to do the big the big push you know it's like okay you know <laughs> you know raise the curtain type of thing yeah this would be the perfect time to do it because the families are together and you know there's there's actually i mean people are a little tense because especially over in the states because they can't pay their bills and and they've got rent coming up um but at the same time they're with their families you know i've, I've gotten a chance because i live in an island north of seattle and there are mm. a lot of people that are walking around around with their younger children mm -hmm. you know there there's this happy sort of this relaxed thing you know there's you know where people are fine you know for the first time getting to to spend you know more hours with their with their families now anyone over the age of 10 you know they're just buried in their cell phones but the younger kids you know they're they're riding bikes they're walking along the beach i've never seen so many freaking kids uh you know with their with their families you know people that have summer homes up here and and you know trying to get away from it all it's it's very very interesting and kind of kind of peaceful in a way even though i kind of feel like it's the calm before the storm but we'll see yeah are you on vashon island oh uh, no we'd be but but good yeah you okay. know you know the area I have somewhat some family over there. you what i have some family over there oh nice yeah, the Northwest is yeah. is doing okay. Uh, they were one of the three big states, you know, to to promote the um, the outbreak stuff. You know, the three big states being New York, California, and Washington. But uh, yeah, it's 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 very very interesting, and uh, I'm I'm just glad I could see this part of it. You know, a lot of people was like, "Well, we're never going to see this in our lifetime." It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, you might. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Well. This has been a really cool interview. <laughs> Thank you. Oh no, happy to, happy, um, happy to do it. And uh, is there anything else that, um, that you want to add? That I mean, I feel like we covered a lot. Yeah, we did cover but... a lot. Um, the only th other things I'd want to add is, you know, to whoever you're you're you know, you're publishing things to, and I hope you get to publish it. You know, depending on what happens in the next couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Is that what I try to stress to people is look all the things I've said, you know, again, don't take my word for it. Um, I became what I am because I did my own research and my, I asked my own questions. I didn't become a, become a flat earther because somebody convinced me of it. I became a flat earther because I tore down the globe myself. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's a big thing I tell people. I go, look, take everything that you, when you watch the media, when you listen to the media, take everything that they say uh, with a grain of salt you know don't don't take it at face value uh, there's always ulterior motives they have companies that they work for and they have parent companies and so on and so on uh, figure out why stories happen the way they do try to look between the lines and again you know, let me end with this there's a great quote which I think is great which is trust everyone but count your change yeah. So. Who is that from? I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> I just I heard that one one year, and it's like, yeah, it's it's one of those old colloquialisms from back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. Wow. Thank you. Um. So if you wouldn't mind sending me this recording, oh yeah, 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 that yeah. Would be yeah. Really as soon as as soon as I hang up, it'll uh it'll compile, and then I will send it to you probably through um we transfer okay okay um and then yeah so the article i mean we are hoping well so yeah i mean it's a print magazine so like all of course none of the printing presses are open yeah um, so like in theory we were hoping to print the magazine at the end of april but who knows who knows so, um I, I can definitely you know send you a copy oh yeah 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 if you get that far that if you get that far time. email me and and let me know yeah i'd be i'd love to see it yeah so so that'll definitely happen okay. i just don't recommend <laughs> because of our world sure situation. of course <laughs> all right yeah great well thank you thank you so much oh, yeah. mark and i hope you have a great day you too stay safe okay, okay bye, bye, -bye.